My name is Mike. I'm the senior pastor here. It's my privilege to lead and to love this church family and to open God's word with you today. Today is also the last day that we will worship together without saying good morning to Parkway Cuero every week. Next Sunday morning, we are launching every week at the Ag Center in Cuero, 10 a.m. It is going to be awesome to see the impact that the core has on their community and see the church built in Cuero. We are so thankful for all of those that serve and all of those that give and all of those that make ministry happen here at Parkway. And we are launching into a new season and I can't wait to see what the Lord does among us. Remember, it was about this time last year that a core said, if 27 adults and 12 kids could start Parkway in Victoria, what could we do in Cuero? Next week, we are taking our next step to answer that question. What can we do together to make a difference for the gospel in Cuero? I'm super excited about it and thankful for those that have led so well and prayed and served so well. Well, today we are continuing a series where we are looking in 1 Peter and discovering ancient truths for some of our modern day challenges. And today in 1 Peter chapter 4, the question that's going to get asked time and time again, if you knew the will of God, would you do it? Because many of us say, Mike, if God would just tell me what he wants me to do with my life, I would sell out to that God. You can have my heart. You can have it all. I give it all to you. I'll follow you fully if you would just tell me what you want me to do. If you would just let me know what your will is, God, I will do your will for all of my life. But my question is, and 1 Peter 4 is going to challenge us, if you knew the will of God, would you actually do it? Because in 1 Peter chapter 4 and other scriptures, we're going to see that the will of God is mapped out perfectly in the word of God. And that you and I as believers don't have to search for God's will like it can't be found. We have to see God's will where it's written in scripture. So if God called you, if God showed you his will for your life, would you live it? I would like to think that I would say yes. I would hope to think that you and I would all say yes. But the call to do God's will is a personalized call that each and every one of us as believers and followers in, of Christ must answer the call and say yes to the will of God as we see it from the word of God. Years ago, I was tested with this idea, if Jesus called me, would I do his will? Christy and I were at home in Virginia, and the phone rang at our house. We used to have these things at home called phones, and they were plugged into the wall. And one of the amazing technologies that existed back then was you would look at your landline, and you could tell who was calling, even if they weren't in your contact list. And so I looked at the caller ID, and I held the phone out to her. I said, Christy, I don't think I can take this one. She said, why not? I said, it's from Christ the King. She said, you got to be kidding me. I was like, no, caller ID, Christ the King. I don't think I can take this one. She said, you better. So about the fourth ring, I pushed talk. I put it up to my ear. Hello. Hey, Mike, this is Karen. Is Christy home? I said, Karen, yeah, what are you doing? She said, I'm volunteering at church today. You know, Christ the King Lutheran Church. <laughs> it wasn't Jesus calling, it was Karen calling. But that idea that if Jesus would call me, I'd pick up the phone without reservation, that idea that if God told me his will and it was clear to me and for me that I would do it naturally, was challenged in that moment for me. And I have a feeling you might get challenged as we look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and we hear the call of Christ the King on our life. So we're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with this same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for human desires but rather 
for the will of God. There's something that happens in our sanctification process as we wrestle with sin, as we suffer with the struggles and temptations that come in life, as we suffer through difficulties and challenges that come through life, there's something that happens that as we suffer and we endure, as First Peter has taught us, we learn how to be done with sin more and more. And when we're done with sin, when we're done with the ignorant way of living, the Bible teaches us, then we have a desire not for the earthly, sinful ways, not for human, evil desires, but instead we have a desire and a commitment to the will of God for our life. There's something that happens as you and I, we believe in Jesus and then we start following him as the leader and Lord of our life. And we wrestle with sin. We wrestle with the tough parts of life. And we endure and we overcome and we see the victory we have in Christ. And all of a sudden, our commitment to his will overcomes our desire for our sinful ways. Our desire for the evil human desires that live within us diminishes. Because we are now not living for those. But instead, we are living for the will of God. I hope you know this. If you're a disciple of Jesus, if you've believed in him and are following him with all of your life, you don't live the rest of your life for evil human desires but instead for the will of God. You see, that's what the Bible teaches here, that you and I, when we struggle with sin, that you and I, when we struggle in life, that that suffering and that struggle is worth it because it fine-tunes us, it focuses us, it motivates us to live not our will, but His will. It pushes us, pulls us, strengthens us, to live the will of God for our life. And here's what I love about 1 Peter. Peter not only challenges us to live the will of God, but he teaches us what the will of God is for our life. So what is the will of God for your life, believer in Jesus? Well, we know the first will of God for every life is that we would love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. God's ultimate will for your life is that you would love him with everything that you've got. God's ultimate will for your life, Jesus said, it's the greatest commandment, love God with everything you've got. And as you look at the will of God for your life, we are motivated by God's love. We are motivated by the understanding that Jesus is coming again to make all wrongs right. We're motivated to live the will of God because we love God. See, we love God more than we love the world. And so we're motivated to live his will. We love God more than we love the things of our past. So we are motivated to live his will. We love God more than even comfort itself. So we are motivated to live his will. And listen how Peter encourages the church to love God and to long for Jesus' return. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded so that you may pray. As Peter challenges the church here, he says the end is near. He says everything that's happened has happened so that Jesus can return. The end is near. He says the end is near, that it's imminent. It could happen at any time. And we know that we are thousands of years since the writing of this passage. And yet the return of Christ is just as imminent today as it was the day that Peter penned this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so because the end is near, you and I should be alert. We should be sober-minded so that we can pray. Prayer and trusting God in the midst of suffering, in the midst of struggle, is one of the greatest ways that we show and deepen our love for God. And Peter here says, in tough times, in challenging seasons, 
Be alert and be sober-minded so that we may what? So that we may pray. One of the things that we do as believers in Jesus right now is we wait on Jesus' return. It could happen at any moment. It's based on God's timetable. So what's God's will for you while you wait? It's to live your life in such a way that prayer is a marker, that prayer isn't a last result or last last ditch effort, but prayer is a first response to challenges. See, listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 about the will of God in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Right now, as you love God and you wait on Jesus' return, right now, as you love God, alert and sober-minded, this is the will of God for you. Pray, rejoice, give thanks. In any waiting season, waiting is never wasted because we're waiting on the Lord. When you and I have to wait on God's perfect timing, whether it's for Jesus' return, and we're all waiting on that perfect timing, or God's perfect timing in your life to give you what you desire in a timeline that's best for you, if you're ever waiting on God, the will of God for your life, don't miss it from Scripture. Rejoice. God is worth waiting on. Pray continually. While you wait, talk with him. While you wait, trust him. While you wait, pray continually. And while you wait, give thanks in all circumstances. Friends, we have been so blessed by God. He demonstrated his love for us first. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And now, our response to him is love and thankfulness and gratitude for who he is and what he's done. Right now, if you are waiting on the Lord, this is the perfect time to continue to fall more and more in love with the Lord and to express your love and to experience his love. Right now, if you're in a season of waiting, I invite you to draw near to the Lord and the Bible promises he will draw near to you because you love him. Tonight, we are going to worship together as a church family. And I invite you, if you're in a waiting season on the Lord, draw near to him this evening, 6.30, worship night, here at Parkway Victoria, everybody's welcome. Or if you're in a season of thankfulness and you say, God, I just have to declare and express my love for you, I invite you to draw near and worship him consistently, and maybe even for a special time this evening. Because it's God's will for our life that we rejoice, that we pray, that we give thanks. It's God's will that we love God. The second is God's will is that we love people. When Jesus said the greatest command is love God with everything you've got, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself, he taught us the will of God for our life. And listen to how Peter teaches us as well. 1 Peter 4, 8 and 9. Above all, Love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. See, when Jesus tells us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, that requires that we love people like God has loved us. That requires that we love people and forgive people and give grace and kindness and compassion to others like God has done the same for us. And here in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, we see that love, this type of love, covers a multitude of sins. How does love cover a multitude of sins? 
Well, how has God's love covered a multitude of your sins? When you love someone and they offend you, sometimes you overlook that offense. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. How does love cover a multitude of sins? We see it here. It shifts our focus from holding grudges to extending grace. When the Bible challenges us to offer hospitality without grumbling, it's reminding us to live with an open, loving life to people without complaining, without grumbling. And that's only possible if we refuse to hold grudges against people. When you and I decide to love people like God loves us, we let go of the wrongs that were done against us. Instead of keeping a list of wrongs with people, what if you kept a list of rights with people? What if instead of creating a list of all the things that your kids get wrong in a week, what if you instead you begin to see what are they getting right? And you begin to celebrate the right. Because what happens, we see it in Scripture. The more we do what's right, the more we overcome the sinful patterns of our past, and the more we long to live the will of God. What if our motivation became, we aren't going to hold any grudges. We aren't going to hold anything against anyone, because that's not how God loves us. Instead, we're going to celebrate when growth in life happens. We're going to celebrate and reward when right is done. Because that's how God treats us as followers of Christ. How does love cover a multitude of sins? Sometimes love overlooks those offenses, just refuses to be triggered. It's not worth my time, my emotion. They didn't mean it, so I'm going to overlook it. Sometimes love shifts our focus to extending grace instead of holding grudges. And sometimes love covers a multitude of sins by us freely forgiving others' faults, even if they don't deserve it. When you understand the grace and mercy of God that's been extended to you, you didn't deserve it, I didn't deserve it. I wanted it, needed it, didn't deserve it. When we understand that we don't deserve what God gives, we give what they don't deserve. We offer our forgiveness freely. And forgiveness is truly you freeing yourself from their sin against you. Forgiveness is you cutting the ties so that what they did to you won't be carried into your future. Forgiveness is you saying, I'm freeing myself from what you have done to me. Now, just to be crystal clear, when we forgive others, when we allow love to cover a multitude of sins and so we don't get offended or triggered, when we allow love that covers a multitude of sins to shift our focus to grace instead of grudges, we're not saying that what they did was okay. But what we're saying is that what Jesus has done for me is enough for me to forgive them. We're not saying what they did is okay. We're saying what Jesus has done for me is enough for me to overlook that. I don't have to fight for myself. Jesus has won the victory. The battle is his, not mine. It does not excuse wrongdoing, but rather it chooses to prioritize reconciliation, harmony, and restoration. Because that's what God did for us. And some in your heart right now may be arguing with me. You say, Mike, this type of love isn't possible. Well, can I just remind you, in 1 Peter chapter 1, we learned that we were born not with a perishable seed, but an imperishable seed. And that because we were born with the imperishable seed, the very love of God lives in us. So we can love each other deeply. In 1 Peter 1, we discovered that the ultimate expression of a Christian's life is holiness plus love. And holiness plus love is exactly what Peter's teaching us one more time in chapter 4. It's not possible in your own strength, in your own ability, to love like this. 
And here's the good news. You don't have to. Because as believers in Jesus, you were born with an imperishable seed. You were born with a seed that teaches you how to love one another deeply as God has loved you. That's why it's possible, as 1 Peter 2 says, to live the will of God as we love people. If you knew the will of God, would you live it? 1 Peter 2, verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the talk of foolish people. You know what God's will for your life is? That you silence the talk. You don't encourage the chatter. God's will for you is that you silence the talk of ignorant people, not giving them more content to talk about. God's will is that you love them, even if they talk about you. God's will for you is that you love them even if they don't want what's best for you. God's will for you is that you do good and you love people. Let's keep going. God's will is that we'd love him and that we'd love people. As we keep reading in 1 Peter 4, we're going to see that God's will is also that every believer serves Jesus. Listen to this, 1 Peter 4, verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Remember, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we learn that we are a spiritual house being formed together, that we are little stones being called together by the living stone, the cornerstone of our life, Jesus Christ. And because we are the body of Christ, we are commanded here in 1 Peter 4 to use the gifts that God gave us when we put our faith in him. See, every believer in Jesus, when they put their faith in Christ, was given not only the gift of salvation, but a spiritual gift, or two, or three, or ten, however the Lord chose to gift you, to build up the body of Christ and to be used by him. And Peter says this grace gift that you received, you are administering God's grace in its various forms, so be a minister of God's grace. To faithfully serve others. You were given a gift because you are a part of the body of Christ, and the body of Christ needs you and your gift mo mobilized to strengthen the body of Christ itself. So the question becomes if you knew the will of God, would you live the will of God? Serving Jesus. Some would say, Mike, I absolutely would, but how do I find my gift? Well, over the decades, we have taken tests to find spiritual gifts. Over the decades, we have looked at key conversations with people to discover what our gifts are. I remember a conversation I had with my pastor in Huntsville as I was dealing with my call to ministry and potential gifts to serve in ministry. He told me, go try it. And I think the number one way for you to find your spiritual gift is to watch what you do when God works. When God works, what do you naturally do? And we know that God doesn't give anyone the spiritual gift of do nothing. We know that every believer has a gift that they can use. So when God moves, what do you do? One of the things you may notice about me is that when we have a time of worship where your hands are both lifted high and you are praying and you are singing and you are fully engaged, you might notice that in those times of great worship, I've got my phone out and my thumbs are flying faster than they've ever flown in their life. Because when God moves, I am inspired to write. I'm inspired to see scripture in ways that will help me and help others. So you may be lifting your hands and you look over and you're like, I think Mike's on Facebook. No, he's not. He's using his gift of teaching. I'm going to hear what God told him in that moment. Probably six weeks from now and it's going to be awesome. There's a, another time when I discover my gifts. Whenever there's a crisis, my gifts of leadership and administration pop up. And my kids will tell you, Dad loves a crisis. 
when everybody else gets scared, dad gets focused. And he's able to lead through crisis with his gifts. And they're absolutely right. I love a crisis. Sometimes I'll cause one just for the fun of leading through it. <laughs> love a crisis. But what do you do when God moves? When you see God moving, do you draw near to people because they look like they're on the outside? That's the gift of hospitality. When you see God moving and you notice the hurting among us, do you go to them and love them? That's the gift of mercy. When God is moving, what are you doing in response to his movement? When God is moving and you see a need, and you step up and you say, I don't really have a passion in this area, but I see a need in this area. I don't really have ownership of this area, but I see a need, so I'm going to step up and fill that need. God's moving, and there's a need. That's called the gift of servanthood, where you are simply saying, Lord, wherever you need, I will serve. When there's a financial need, when God is moving, there are people within the body of Christ that are motivated to give generously. And the gift of giving is what we see in those moments. And the gift of giving isn't reserved for the wealthy. The gift of giving isn't reserved for those that have margin. The gift of giving is given to those who are part of the body of Christ. And when they see God move, they say, how can I support it, even if it costs me something, financially? So my question, if God is moving... What are you doing in response to his move? Because we've all been gifted. When he moves, we all have work to do. And it's his will for you. And it's his will for me. Listen to how Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, verse 6 and 7. Doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. What's the will of God for your life? That you would serve God wholeheartedly, not people. That you would serve him without obligation or compulsion, without grumbling or complaining. His will is that you would serve him because you are becoming more and more like Jesus. And Jesus himself said, no servant is greater than their master. So it's the will of God, hear it clearly, that every believer serves others, not out of obligation or compulsion, but from a heart that is willing and eager to serve. You seem like, I wanted to know the will of God for my life. Where does he want me to live? Where does he want me to work? Who does he want me to marry? You know, what's my life supposed to look like? I'm telling you exactly from the word of God, the answer to your questions isn't found just in you. It's found in you, loving God, loving people, and serving Jesus faithfully. If you knew the will of God, would you do it? There's one more challenge from 1 Peter 4, 16. And that's this. The will of God is that we enjoy the life that God has given us. 1 Peter 4, 16, the Bible says, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. See, there's this push throughout 1 Peter that we love the life God has given us because we are falling more in love with him and we're serving people as a natural outpouring of our life so we can love the life he's given us, even if that life includes suffering. One of the challenges that we see throughout 1 Peter 4, and we're going to see it again here in just a moment, is there are times when suffering is the will of God for you and those you love. And you don't have to feel shame when you suffer. You can love this season because you're loving God. You don't have to blame others for your suffering. You can love this season because the suffering isn't because of you or them. It's because of Christ in you. It's because of God's will for you. If suffering 
isn't because you're doing something wrong or because others are doing something wrong to you. What if it's God's will? What if it's because you're doing something right? I want to encourage you to have the courage of your convictions and have faith like few people see. And I want for you to know that this is the will of God and to live that will for you. Listen to what 1 Peter 4, 19 encourages us with. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Friends, if you're in a season of suffering, you may be tempted to pull back from God's people. You may be tempted to pull back from God's work. You may be tempted to pull back from God's will. But what if you're smack dab in the middle of God's will right now? Don't pull back. Don't withdraw. Continue to love him. Continue to serve others. Continue to have your heart open to people. Continue, continue, continue. One last verse. Hebrews 10, verse 36. Why do we continue? You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. When you and I learn how to persevere, when you and I learn how to endure, when you and I learn that it's not always easy to follow Jesus, but it's always right to love God, love people, and to serve Jesus, when we realize that, and we endure for the will of God. God, I'm not comfortable right now, but I love the life you've given me. God, this isn't easy right now, but I love the life you've given me because this is your will for me right now. There's a blessing that's received. Now, I'm not gonna promise you that that's a blessing that you will experience here on earth, but I can promise you that faithfulness is always remembered and blessed in heaven. I can't promise you that you're going to reap earthly rewards and great gain. But I can promise you that when you store up treasures in heaven, no thief can steal, no moth can destroy. Nothing can steal what God holds for you. No one can take what God shields for you in heaven because you're faithful today. So friends, if you knew the will of God for your life, would you live it? Because Peter says God's will for you is love God, love his people, serve faithfully. And while you're at it, live so thankfully that even if you're in the midst of suffering, you can say, God, thank you for the life that you've given me. I love this life and I love you. If you looked on your phone today and Christ the King called, would you choose to answer? And would you do what he says? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the chance to open your word and to learn and grow together. God, I pray in all of our lives that you would help us where we are hurting, help us where we are struggling. God, may you even strengthen us where we feel good. May you strengthen us where we are already strong so that we can stand up by faith, whether weak or strong, so that we can have a living hope no matter what we are living through. And God, I pray right now for the church. God, I pray that believers gathered together in our family would love you with everything they've got and would love people in such a way that it shows that they're not loving with their own power, but they're loving, loving others with your power in them. God, I pray that you would help all of us to say yes to serving you using our gifts to build up the church, using our gifts to strengthen the body because we are all a part of the body of Christ and we are all priests, ministers of the gospel. And God, may you help us live with thankfulness so that even if we're not happy right now, say, God, I love my life and help me to grow in holiness. But even if it's not easy, God, I love my life because I love you and I'm following you. 
as the church prays, if you're gathered with us today on campus or online and you've never believed in Jesus, the Bible here says Christ suffered in his body, which is referring to his death on the cross for us. They executed an innocent man for the guilt that you and I carry. They laid him in a tomb. And three days later, he was raised again from the dead to prove that he's God and to offer life to everyone who puts their faith in him. And the amazing good news of the gospel is not only does God rescue us from hell, but he changes us and makes us new creations giving us a new way of life and a new leader to follow in all of our life. And so today, if you have never put your faith in Christ, I invite you to make today the day that you believe that you're a sinner who needs a Savior and that Jesus is your only Savior. If today's your day, let's mark it with a prayer. You can pray, Jesus, I believe. I believe that I'm a sinner who needs a Savior and that you are the Savior of the world. Thank you for coming for me for dying in my place and being raised again from the dead. Today, I believe. Thank you for giving me life. Friend, if today was your day to believe, let somebody know. Tell the friend that brought you, use a response card in front of you. Stop by the information center at your location and pick up a new believer's kit. It's a Bible and some other free resources to help you get 